Welcome back, my fellow watchers of the multiverse, to another brand new If I Had Written, where I'm reimagining pop culture. I'll be taking different series and writing them. I do pre writes, rewrites, canceled projects, and so much more in the world of pop culture. So, if that's something that you like, I would highly recommend to click that big red button and i do want to say thank you so so much the bottom of my heart we just recently hit over 200,000 subscribers on this channel and honestly if you would have told me a few years ago if i would have hit that i would never have believed you it's been a long journey through doing so many different videos like reporting on you know marvel spider-man news and then a few years later i finally got into my passion and that was writing and doing what if content and even now doing if i had written content so i cannot thank you enough for the amazing support my fellow watchers and everybody who's seen the miss the part channel and people that i've worked with like i cannot thank you enough it's been a phenomenal experience and it's only going to get better from here because my main goal to, is to get this channel i'm serious here to a million subscribers i think we can make it happen one day it will happen it might not happen today but it could happen tomorrow so that being said thank you so much for the amazing support and i know a lot of people have been wondering if i had written the amazing spider-man 3 it is now officially out so what are we all waiting for Let's dive into this insane fan fiction. The rain pitter pattered against the window panel, allowing the moonlight to shine inside the room. Peter had his knees tucked against his chest and his disheveled hair curtaining his face. He pulled on his legs, rubbing his hands against the fabric and muttering as if recreating a ritual. He had a suit on as if that would convince him to jump out of bed and spring into action. All he had to do was stick to the side of his window and slide it up. He could crawl out and swing through the city, stopping crime left and right. Yet he couldn't. His lungs felt as though they shrunk to the size of peanuts and his hands refused to release the red and blue attire covering his skin. It felt foreign. It felt as though he was wearing an outfit meant for another. In a way, it felt as though Peter wanted to rip it off and throw it as far as he could. The silent chamber known as his room seemed cramped. His desk was cluttered with papers that had no valuable words on them. They were office supplies scattered around the floor leaving barely any room for his feet to walk. His two cameras were hanging off the unstable clip attached to the back of his door. The door itself had chips on it, showing where the paint had cracked. The police scanner on his desk had male voices going back and forth in between the static. They threw out codes Peter pretended to care about. Most of them were codes clarifying that they had good signals. Others were low-level crimes Peter did not bother getting out of bed for. It wasn't that he didn't want to move. It was more that he couldn't. Every muscle in his body yelled at him whenever he so much as moved. His mind felt numb from all the thinking it had done the past few days. He couldn't get her off his mind since it happened. He had tried to move on and get back to work, but nothing brought his sanity back. A picture of her stayed taped to the top of his desk. She had the most gorgeous blonde locks that curtained her face. He loved the way it shaped her cheeks whenever she had it thrown into a ponytail. It showed off her beautiful glowing irises. He thought he'd see every day. As it turned out, he had lost that privilege. He had lost Gwen. Several seconds slipped by, slithering into the pool of sweat, soaking his mattress. 
The seconds turned into minutes, and the minutes turned into an hour, before the static cleared and Peter's body stiffened. The hairs on the back of his neck shot up, his eyes bulging as he focused his senses on the police scanner, not far from him. It clearly said one code. One code he recognized more than the rest. The code for a shooting. The motivation he lost came back to him in that moment. His window slid up, and he darted through it, throwing on his mask and swinging through the streets of the vibrant New York City. The lights flashed across his face, billboard advertisements showing the tour of a band he didn't recognize filled his vision. He ran across it and leaped, attaching a web to the nearest skyscraper and pulled himself into the night sky, clouded with rain. Twinkling stars glistered overhead, showing off the bright moon next to them. It waved to Peter as he passed, but he didn't have the strength to wave back. From what he had heard, there was an active shooting at a Bank of America. At the Bank of America, located near the Empire State Building. He swung by it and didn't bother glancing at the people cheering below. Some booed, others cheered, or maybe they weren't doing anything. And it was a fragment of Peter's mind, made to ease his hefty heart. As he approached the bank, he heard the gunshots before he could go anywhere, before he could see where they were coming from. He saw the familiar red paint of the Bank of America logo. There were police cruisers pulled out in front, spotlights shining on the entrance, guns pulled, shields drawn. Peter wouldn't be surprised if the SWAT teams came next. Despite the danger of the situation, Peter couldn't let any of those officers lose their lives. He swooped down and landed on the side of the large building. The officers noticed him crawling along. Peter could see their focus shift from the target to him. He didn't answer their stares. Instead, he got to the roof and searched for an alternative way inside. As much as he wanted to act fast, going in head first and getting shot wouldn't help anyone. He searched through the stone top of the bank, but there were no vents or skylights. He had to go through the old-fashioned way. Peter stood on the ledge and glanced down. It was a far drop. He stiffened as he looked at the ground. It was like he could see her ghost waiting at the bottom, hanging by a web. Peter shot too late. The image caused his hands to squeeze into fists as he let the air hit him. He launched himself to the sidewalk and landed on his feet, lunging inside to see if he could locate the shooters before they could locate him. The inside had flickered lights and cash spilled on the floor. It was too late, at night for there to be any customers, which meant there was no blood in the vicinity. Yet as he stepped through the darkness, he couldn't help but feel as though he was stepping into pools of identified liquid. Yet another way his mind made him think he was a better man than he actually was. A light flashed, and at the same time, a muzzle did. A bullet ripped through the air and grazed Peter's suit. His first reaction was to jump out of the way and behind the nearest wall. That wasn't a wall at all, but rather a bench. His second reaction was to focus on his spider sense. He closed his eyes and breathed, but the rage, festering inside his gut, rose to his chest. Then, it rose to his mind, as it snapped into reality and forced Peter to move at a speed that he had never moved before. The first stopped, which either signaled that the shooter had given up or ran out of ammo. Peter didn't hear any clicks or any other noises indicating the latter, so he went with the former as he rushed out of cover and attached a web to the ceiling. He could almost smell the shooter. The gunpowder infected the air and plagued Peter's poor nostrils as he launched himself toward the figure, cloaked in darkness. Before another shot could go off, Peter had the culprit pinned to the ground. A light flickered and revealed the masked face of a man with sharp hazel eyes. Peter trembled as he pinned the man down 
He had his hand wrapped around the criminal's throat. He squeezed harder than he intended, but his heart signed from relief at the sudden release of anger. Peter wanted more. He wanted to squeeze harder and hear his knuckles crack as he increased pressure. However, before he had the chance to, the sirens got louder, giving him a newfound sense of self. Peter had got off the shooter in time for the police to shout orders and sprint inside the bank. Peter kicked the rifle away from the man's grasp and went to the ceiling. He hung upside down and watched the police apprehend the stranger. Their flashlights flew across Spider-Man's face as he pranced his way outside the bank and outside. The rain hit him once more. His suit got drenched in the moisture as he hosted himself back to the roof of the bank. The police were more occupied with the crime than Spider-Man. That gave Peter a moment to collect his thoughts. But as he gained down at the abyss below, he realized he had not had a signal thought in his head. Peter had a love-hate relationship with the Bugle. Working for them gave him a temporary relief from the thoughts plaguing his mind. At the same time, the pace sucked and he got mistreated on a daily basis. His superiors treated him like garbage and gave him the worst rates for the stellar photos he took. It didn't matter if he had one of a kind on his hands. It wasn't enough. It seemed as though nothing he did was ever. As he sat at his desk, his eyes on one of the other employees who had always been in the corner with his head in files. His name was Eddie Brock. According to Peter's research, Peter made his mission to know every employee working in his area. He didn't want to risk any surprises or potential leads on cases. A rundown, crap office job like this was a perfect way to hide dangerous acts behind a fake smile. Eddie seemed like bad news. He wore checkered shirts every day. That alone made Peter uncomfortable. Peter had already finished most of his work for the day. Mints two folders that had three articles in each of them. Editing news articles didn't appeal to him when he could scope out the workplace instead. He knew he was searching for an excuse to get his mind off his past, but he let himself live in blissful ignorance of his misdoings. Instead, he rose from the desk, cracked his knuckles, and approached Eddie. The man glanced up and pulled out his lanyard. Eddie smelled of sweat. His hands were sweating, and Peter could see pit stains forming. If Eddie didn't wear blue and white checkered shirts, maybe Peter wouldn't have been able to see it. That added another reason to dislike Eddie. Peter, right? Eddie asked, forcing a tight smile. A forced smile, the third reason to dislike Eddie. Right, Eddie, Peter asked. He leaned against the side of the metal desk. It creaked. Two of Eddie's files fell over because of it. That's me, can I help you? Peter motioned to the computer on Eddie's desk. I need you to finish my work pile. I have to go home early. My login and password is on the sticky note at my desk. What? Why me? Don't, don't you have your own desk, mate? Don't worry about it, Peter said as he tapped his fingers on the side of Eddie's desk. The man swallowed, his eyes darting around Peter's face, as if searching for an answer Peter didn't have. I don't think you're as bad at your job as he is. Impress me. Thanks, bud. Peter clapped Eddie on the shoulder and walked away, leaving the office and going to the break room to get much needed space. He ended up pressing his hands against his head and groaning. The interaction played in his mind over and over again. Peter had no idea why he chose Eddie of all people, but the man seemed too easy. He had been an easy target for Peter. Maybe Parker would continue to pile work on Brock. If it got Peter out of scrolling through words that muddled together and all said the same thing. Every sentence felt the same anymore, even if the article was covering a completely different topic. Peter cursed to himself at his thoughts. Eddie was an innocent man Peter shouldn't have taken advantage of, but Peter's guilt didn't stop him from wanting to do it again and again. It didn't stop him from wishing to pass 
all of his work off on Eddie. If he could get away with it, he would. The problem was, he didn't know what he was doing. He didn't recognize himself, and he doubted he ever would again. Peter rubbed his fingers on the side of his phone. Anyone who ever gave him advice suggested he needed to move on and begin a new journey for himself. He didn't know how to do that. As he stared at the dating app on his phone, he didn't know if that was the best option. It made him feel weak. It felt as though he was resorting to the last option, and that didn't sit right with him. However, he had been struck on one woman for one hour. She had the most gorgeous red hair that shaped her face perfectly. Her blue eyes shined even through the screen. The picture captured her as a smile crinkled her face and showed her off with a joy radiating through her body. To top it all off, he adored her bio. It was simple. It told her tale about sounding sappy or forced. She sounded like someone he'd get along with, maybe even fall in love with. Peter found himself scrolling through her photos again. There were only five of them, but each one told a different tale. They captured the different corners of her personality. There was her smile, then her attending an art fair, then her after a jog, and the list went on. She chose all the right images to showcase who she was, and the photographer inside Peter adored that idea. He peeked at the picture on his desk, the one of Gwen. It was enough to convince him to shut off his phone and bury his head in his pillows. He had worked a long shift at the Bugle, and had an hour until he considered himself on Spider-Man duty. Peter wasn't sure if he would wallow in misery or stretch before the big night. It was a Friday, which meant there was more traffic in the city. Peter miraculously decided to depart his creaky bed to instead go to his desk and sit. He ignored the picture of Gwen, although it painted him to do so. He took a deep breath as he picked up the note buried beneath all the other papers. It had his father's handwriting on it. Peter didn't have much of his parents left. He knew he got his interest in science from his father, but he didn't know the extent of it. As he scanned over the note, he realized just how much of his father he had in him. He latched onto the note as if it was the last part of himself he had left. Peter ended up slumping over on his desk and staring at the letters in the dim light. It was a receipt of some kind. There were chemicals he recognized, and others that seemed made up. Like from a fantasy novel, Peter didn't know what it meant, or if he should try to recreate it. All he knew was that the note was left for Peter. The future Peter, anyway. Locked away in a box awaiting Peter when he was ready for work and life. Peter, despite being an adult, still didn't feel ready. He ideally picked and prouded at the corners of the note. There were no words he cared for, none that stood out to him. Peter froze as he stared at it. He sat up and adjusted his lamp, shining the light directly on the mess of the words before him. Although there were no words he thought mattered, the first letter of each word seemed carefully selected. The receipt seemed random, except it wasn't. Every letter spelled out a word, a name Peter recognized, Octavius. He didn't need to know the context behind the note to know what Octavius Industries was. It was hard to miss seeing as it stood not far from Peter's location. He could swing there now and investigate, assuming he could get in, or he could pose as Peter and go there, pretending to be a tourist. He doubted the second option would work, so he opted for the first one. Peter changed into his spider suit and grabbed the note. He scanned over it one last time until he realized two of the supposed chemicals had numbers in them. When lined up, they made one number, 96. Octavius 96. Peter didn't know what it meant, but he figured it had something to do with a room titled that, unless there was another code he didn't know the answer to yet. Perhaps, he would find out when he arrived. Peter shoved the note under the small space between his mask and neck, 
to keep it secure, he slid the window up and departed, the rain hitting his body, since it seemed as though the city couldn't give him clear skies for once. Spider-Man leaped into action, sooner than he had expected to. There were countless people below as he jumped between the giant buildings. The lights of the billboards covered him in a sea of different colors, purples and golds, and scions. Every color illuminated the red and blue of his suit as he mentally calculated how far Octavius Industries was. Peter arrived only a few minutes later. He was amazed by the size of the place. It made him feel like a kid again. Peter wondered if... In a way, he still was. He went to the top of it and searched for an alternative way in. Like what he did with the bank, he found a vent, but he knew he should scout the area first. Although he knew it would reveal his presence, he crawled alongside the windows of the Goliath, scanning the inside and searching for any potential leads. He found nothing but empty rooms. Most of the windows were tinted, the only ones that weren't showed him no use. Peter decided to slip inside the building. Through the vent, he located on top of the building. As soon as he entered, he smelled an overwhelming scent of chemicals. He couldn't identify which ones they were exactly, due to how many there were. They were explosive. They danced across his face and clung to his nose. Peter coughed and regretted it immediately. He could hear voices down the hallway beneath him. Peter held his breath, as if that would make up for the coughing. He had waited, and he waited to hear more of what they were saying. Run tests on Subject 313, and inform the gentleman of what had occurred today, a male voice said, his voice echoing as if he were in a long corridor. Yes, sir, a female voice replied. Peter heard the clink of high heels until it faded into the distance. Then, an elevator dinged from the other side, signaling Peter was all alone again. Peter crawled through the vent until he saw a small opening and took off the panel, prohibiting him from sneaking inside. He dropped down and knew he didn't have much time. The cameras would pick him up and trigger a security alert. That was if they didn't already when they saw him investigating the outside. The corridor was indeed long. It had a checkered white floor that had Peter huffing. What was it about checkered patterns and their habit of showing up when Peter didn't want them to? There were shiny metal elevators on the left side of him, and two fake plants rested on either side of the double elevators. Peter made sure to wait a few seconds just in case the man from before was still in the elevator. He pressed the button and saw it glow, the same color as his suit. Ten seconds later, it opened and revealed a tiny space illuminated by a white light that matched the lights in the hallway. Peter entered and stuck his foot against the door. He checked the amount of floors, and surely enough, he was on the top floor, the 96th floor. Octavius 96th, whatever his father left in this message, had to be here. Seeing as the top floor was small and smelled of chemicals, Peter knew there had to be a dangerous substance nearby. His spider sense was tingling, and he listened to it. Parker followed his instinct and went down the pathway going to the end of the hallway, where one door waited for him. It was metal and had a fingerprint scanner outside of it. Peter cursed when he realized there was no way he could get inside. Then he got a stupid idea. It was foolish and would never work, but he was so desperate. So Peter webbed himself to the top of the ceiling that wasn't too far above him. He jumped up so he was swinging. Then when he had a steady grip, he swung himself toward the metal door. His feet collided with the door, making a small dent. Peter knew he had incredible strength, but he hadn't thought it went this far. Peter chuckled to himself at the newfound strength and repeated the move twice, three times, four, five, and finally, by the sixth try, the door cracked enough to allow Peter enough space to slide in. He crawled in and found a pristine lab with a cyan color scheme. 
The light blue shade filled the room with a cool palette, and the white tables and papers spilled on said tables, complemented on the other soft colors. Peter froze in the middle of the tiny lab. He could sense it. Something was there, but not a human. It felt like a presence he couldn't describe, like it was slimy, like it was a liquid, gas, and solid combined into one. The worst part was, he couldn't tell if it was a friend or a foe. Peter snapped around and saw it. In the corner, hoisted up by one of the man tables, was a glass container with a black storm of chaos swirling around inside it. Peter rushed over to it, picking up the countless notes on the table. They had the same handwriting as his father, and the sight had Peter on the verge of tears. He ended up squeezing too tightly and crushing some of them, but the words remained the same. He saw the same one repeated over and over and over again like a manatra. In a way, it seemed like a cult. Symbiote. Peter snatched the glass container, pulling it out of the metal arms keeping it in place. He gathered as many notes as he could and shoved them against his chest, running out of the room and stepping out in time to see a team of security guards there. They were holding tasers, aiming them at Peter's chest, where he held the most precious documents he had in his life. Freeze! Put down the container! One of the guards yelled, stepping closer. Peter couldn't let them take him. He jumped and attempted to latch onto the ceiling, but the symbiote slipped from his grasp. It crashed to the ground with a loud bang that seemed like it shook all of Octavius Industries. The symbiote lashed out and went after the guards, making them drop their tasers and running away, yelling about needing help. They took the stairs instead of the elevator. Peter gulped and dropped down the symbiote coming back over to him, but not bothering with attacking him. Peter grabbed half of the container. It was only particularly intact, but it would do the job. The symbiote happily went back inside its holding facility, and Peter didn't understand why. Maybe it was a sign from his father, a sign that Peter wasn't alone, that his father was watching over him. Peter left the facility with the papers and the symbiote. He had to shove most of the papers in places he'd rather not to reveal in order to make room for the symbiote in one of his hands. Parker returned to his humble adobe, made sure no one was watching as he slipped inside, and set the symbiote down on the table. I don't know what you are, but I'm going to give you a new home, he said. He didn't know why he was talking to it like a pet, but his spider senses detected no threat. The symbiote protected him. After all, his father led him to it. It was his savior, his guardian angel. Peter got out of his wet suit and put on his normal clothes, scouring his room until he found a metal tin that had just enough space for the symbiote. Sorry, I don't want to lock you up, but it's been a long day, and I need to read through these notes, okay? Peter asked, despite how he knew the thing couldn't talk back. Still... The symbiote got inside the metal tin and allowed Peter to close the lid. He set it aside and sat at his desk with all of the notes. They were soggy from the rain and crinkled from where Peter had to shove them. Peter held the notes and sat in his chair with the contained symbiote next to him. Not every note had his father's handwriting, but a majority of them did. It raised more questions than it answered. Parker wondered why his father trusted Octavius Industries. Of course, Peter wondered what the symbiote was and why it was important in the first place. But he had more pressing questions, like why his father worked for a company such as them. That was assuming he worked for them. Peter tilted his lamp light and stared at the ink spilled out on the page. From the first time in a long time, Peter got excited. He felt giddiness swelling inside his chest as his heart illuminated with life. It felt good to get a part of himself back, even though he was still far from being repaired. Peter stared at the dark fabric. After retrieving the mysterious symbiote his father did, countless research on, 
Peter slept eight hours for the first time since Gwen passed, and he passed out on the notes he read for hours. He felt as though he had accomplished something. It felt like the first accomplishment he made since she left. However, when he woke up, the metal tin was turned over and opened, and he found his spider suit wasn't the same. He hung it up dry since New York City seemed like it wanted to rain all the time. It had been soaked with rainwater, but it seemed as though it had been a mistake to leave it out. Peter would have preferred dealing with a soggy uniform. He didn't know why the symbiote had turned his suit black. He didn't want to think about the logistics of it, and if it made sense. His head already hurt from the thought. Peter liked to view himself as intelligent, but the symbiote was a new level he wasn't prepared for. Peter didn't feel safe putting the suit on, but he knew he didn't have much of a choice. It was his day off from the bugle, which meant he had nothing to do other than being Spider-Man and stopping crime. His scanner was active, shuffling through the static of the police comms. Peter heard nothing of note, but he knew it wouldn't last forever. Eventually, he'd have to put the suit on. He approached it, and with gloves on and a pen, tapped the black suit. Nothing happened. No reaction. Not even a sign of life. The symbiote that had been withering around had nothing to say to him now. Peter would be terrified if he wasn't so fascinated by the very concept of this type of life. From there, Peter cycled through his list of ideas to get the symbiote off of his suit. He tried getting it wet, putting ice on it, throwing books at it, scratching it, peeling it off, and more. Nothing worked, so he gave up and plopped down on his bed. He laid back and stared at the ceiling that had a crack on it. The chipped paint laughed at him. Peter ended up shifting and lying on his side instead. Time passed as he brainstormed ways to remove the symbiote. He didn't have much at his disposal, but he could make a use of extreme temperatures. He didn't know how he could get access to fire when he didn't have matches handy. Perhaps he had candles lying around somewhere but they meant nothing if he didn't have something to light them with. As soon as he fell into his thoughts, he heard a slight increase in volume on the scanner. He snapped up and hopped off his bed. Rushing over and listened, he tuned in, making sure the static had a chance to clear before any important information was revealed. Then it was. Peter heard the familiar police code saying a Grand Theft Auto was in progress. Peter knew he couldn't sit back and watch as the police fought someone in the crowded streets of New York City. Peter didn't have time to think. He knew it was a bad idea, but he put the new suit on. It didn't bite or attack him as soon as he put it on, which was a good sign. He hoped so. Anyway, even the mask was infected with the symbiote. As he covered himself with the new uniform, he realized he didn't feel worse. In fact, he felt better. An overwhelming surge of power washed over him until he grinned under the mask. A laugh spewed from his throat, and for the first time in what felt like decades, Peter had a sense of motivation. It didn't feel like he was going through the motions anymore. It felt like he had a genuine responsibility, a genuine reason to continue being Spider-Man. Peter zoomed past the picture of Gwen on his way to the window. He left, and he immediately jumped, feeling the air brushing by the new attire. His laughter increased as the wind got to him. It made his ears ring as his tongue tasted the pollution New York was known for having. He smelled the smoke from cigarettes, even from a spot up in the air. Every element made him light up with a stay as he relished in the adrenaline swarming through his veins. He did a dance in the sky as he switched between webs, pulling himself along the city streets and following the distant sound of sirens. He moved faster than the slow traffic, leaping between the vehicles and snickering as he did so. He bounced on the hoods of some cars, not bothering with apologizing. His feet made a few dents on multiple cars, but he didn't stop to see the damage 
Instead, he went to go fight crime. He landed on top of one of the police cars, investigating the scene. The officer raced through the horde of cars, swerving to avoid traffic. Peter stayed on top and searched for a possible stolen vehicle. It was described as a Toyota with a silver paint job. He didn't remember the license plate off the top of his head, but he knew it had a C, a 5, and a J in it. It was too vague to draw conclusions, but he had a feeling his spider sense would help him out if the police didn't first. Peter took a moment to rub his new suit. It felt like home. It didn't feel as foreign as many of his other prototype suits had. It didn't feel as foreign as his previous suit. In a way, it felt like what he was looking for. Peter grinned and got up. The police were closing in on one car, a Toyota with a silver paint job and a license plate matching the few letters Peter knew of. His spider sense agreed with him, so Peter stretched his arms and glanced at the building on the right side of him. With, with his webs, he could catch up to the criminal and put an end to the Grand Theft Auto. So, with a deep breath, he swung away. Peter had never felt so incredible before. Two days after receiving the symbiote-enhanced suit, he was still unstoppable. No criminal stood in his way. Eddie Brock did all of his work for him without question. Peter got out of his bed every morning without complaint. For once, he saw more color in his daily activities. He felt like he had more life inside of him. It seemed as though he was at the top of his game as he swung through the streets and waved to the people who noticed him. He had stopped crime all night. He followed police cruisers searched alleyways, listened for screams, and more to figure out where the worst activity was. The criminal stood no chance against Spidey's strength. He webbed up countless criminals to walls and let the police take them away. His job wasn't easy, but it seemed easier now. It appeared as though Peter had more energy as he leaped between the buildings and followed police cruisers to his next destination. As he followed, he stared at the fabric covering him. After reading his father's notes, Peter learned the symbiote was an unknown alien substance that had crashed on Earth. His father had been one of the researchers on the project, but left for unknown reasons. The dates on the top of the notes matched up when, when his father and mother left for that plane. The dates got closer and closer to that fateful day until they stopped altogether. Peter didn't see anything about the symbiote being dangerous. If anything, the notes were positive. They stated that it could be a useful tool for reinventing the future. He wondered if Octavius Industries would seek Spider-Man out when they see the dark suit he had. Peter didn't want to think about it. He had power. He had the strength. That was all he needed. Spider-Man swung through the streets and moved at an efficient rate. He stopped more crime than he had ever done before. Every criminal went to the station with broken bones and blood pouring across their skin. Perhaps Peter was going too hard, but he blamed it on not being adjusted to the suit's powers yet. He eventually decided it had been a long night. So... He got out a suit, put on normal clothes over a suit, and went to visit Aunt May. He had left plenty of his old stuff there. He wanted to take it back. More specifically, he wanted to take the other photos he had of Gwen. May had given him a key in case he ever needed to come inside. That meant he entered without knocking, unannouncing his presence in case she was still awake. He didn't see her anywhere, so he decided to head to his room. However, before he could get there, he heard a woman clear her throat. Sitting under the dim light in the kitchen was Aunt May, with a cup of coffee wrapped around her hands. She took a long, slow sip from it. She didn't bother glancing at him. You didn't knock, she said. Thought you were asleep. It's late. Do you want me to put you to bed? I'm an adult. 
I can handle it, she replied with a chuckle, shaking him off and standing. Sorry if I barged in, I wanted to see my room. I might have left something here. You say that every time, May said. She didn't sound annoyed. Her tone was even and didn't stutter. But Peter couldn't see the disappointment in her body, the way she leaned back on her feet and hung her shoulders. Her frown was hidden by the darkness, but he could sense it was there. Is something wrong? he asked. But he figured he had already knew the answer. Do I get a hug? she asked. Back instead of answering, he didn't budge. May, did someone hurt you? She signed. Will you ever visit to see me? What? Peter asked, stalling over her own words. Just once, I want you to visit and say, I missed you, May. How have you been? Instead of this, I've missed you so much, Peter. I want to know if you've missed me too. I have. It's just been rough recently. That's another thing you say all the time, she said. That time, her voice hitched. Peter scratched his nose and set his shoulders. I'll be in my room if you need me. Do you have to go, she asked, her voice wavering as it passed her lips. Yeah, Peter said, waving his hand. All he wanted to do was see Gwen. The idea of seeing her face had him feeling warm. But May getting in the way made him curl his hands into fists. Please stay. Her voice got weaker with every syllable she spoke. Peter could sense it in her tone, but he ignored it anyway. He brushed her off and turned. Peter did what he had never imagined himself doing. He left her. Do my work. Eddie snapped his head up as Peter sat on the side of his desk. The man had wide eyes as he tucked his hands closer to his body and fiddled with them. What? Eddie asked. Peter didn't like repeating himself, especially to someone who refused to wear anything other than checkered shirts. Do my work. Peter said, resisting the urge to roll his eyes. I have to go out and get some pictures of Spider-Man in action. How do you know where Spider-Man is? Don't you know? There's a rumor he's going to swing through Central Park today. I want to be there when it happens, Peter said, squeezing Eddie's shoulder. He tucked to him for a second longer. Then he meant to. You'll do my work for me, won't you, Ed? Eddie, he replied. But he hitched his voice as he said it. I don't want to keep doing your work for you. I'm already overwhelmed as it is. And Jameson won't leave me alone about how I've been falling behind. So what I've been hearing is you can't handle some extra work. Really. Eddie hung his head and went quiet for a moment. Peter stepped back to give the man the space he needed to think. Then, Eddie signed. Peter lit up and patted Eddie's back. I need you to come around. See you in a few hours. Peter did exactly what he said he would. He went to Central Park, set up cameras, and changed into a spider suit away from public eye, as Spider-Man. He swung through Central Park in his new suit, and gave his cameras the exclusive first look at it in daylight. The pictures came out better than Peter expected. He finished his duties as Spider-Man developed the photos manually, and went into Jameson's office by the time the sun had started to set. He plopped the stack of photos on Jameson's desk and sat in the chair. Peter leaned back and watched as Jameson flipped through them, his secretary smiling when she saw all the incredible shots Peter took. Peter had the suit underneath his clothes. He hadn't taken it off ever since he got in. These are incredible, and no one's ever seen the new Spider-Man suit in daylight before, Jameson said, his voice scratchy and low. Jameson put down the photos and met Peter's intense glaze. I'll give you the usual for them. There's plenty here, so... No, Peter interrupted, placing his feet on Jameson's desk. The mud on the bottom of Peter's shoes dripped off and hit some of the papers near the end of Jameson's desk. Triple the money. You gave me a job, and I proved myself by being a good employee. It's time you treat me like one. You can't be serious, Jameson replied. Peter clicked his tongue and grabbed the photos from out of Jameson's hands. If you don't want them, fine. But I don't tolerate this disrespect, Parker. Peter only smiled. You do now. After he got the extra money, Parker left the office going down the street and smiling to himself as he went. He had music playing in his mind as he embraced the strength he felt flowing throughout his body. He did small dances and caught the attention of many walkers around him. He gave them grins and waved 
but they only looked at him with scrummished eyes as a disgusted expression. Peter ignored them and went on his way. Parker slipped into one of the many alleyways as he claimed as a Spider-Man alleyway. In these alleys were his backpacks. He had hid in case he needed supplies as Spider-Man. He took off his clothes and revealed the spider suit underneath, throwing his regular clothes in the bag and hiding it again. With his web shooters ready, he attached himself to one of the many skyscrapers and darted around. He cheered as he danced through the sky and followed the police sirens as he always did. He found a traffic stop that happened all the time in New York City. However, the next case was a bit more complicated. It was a shoplifter running around with $100 worth of jewelry. Peter swung faster than the shoplifter could run, and he webbed up the criminal. The man went flying upwards due to Peter's height advantage. Peter hung to the side of the building and watched as the man helplessly kicked his legs. Peter made sure both of the man's hands were tied with webs before he attached the criminal to the side of the building. Peter jumped onto the man to make him rock back and forth. The criminal shouted and begged for help as Peter took the jewelry from him. Breaking my eardrums isn't going to get you down, Peter said as he backed off. He had all the jewelry now. The man wasn't so high that he'd die when he fell, but he'd likely fracture if not break both his legs. Spider-Man jumped down and handed the stolen jewelry to the police. Can we arrest him now? One of the officers asked. Spider-Man shrugged. Wait two hours for the webs to dissolve. Then, he swung away, following more police sirens and stopping crimes left and right. Most of them were traffic stops and accusations more than actual crimes. Spider-Man ignored a few old women who needed help across the street. As it turned out, not every day was exciting, even in the city. Spider-Man sat atop a roof and kicked his legs as he oversaw the streets, blustering with life. No crimes underneath him as far as he could see. Peter sat back and yawned, yearning from another criminal to put in his place. He hated criminals more than anything. They were the ones who hurt the most. Peter wished he could put them all in his place. So, for the rest of the day, he waited for his chance to lock up the dirty criminals in the city. Peter sprung into action the second he heard the scanner go off. There was a report of a criminal fleeing from the police. The man had a federal warrant and was armed. Peter knew he had to interfere. There were plenty of hidden spots in the city. Due to how crowded it was, Peter knew he'd have to rely on his spider senses and his knowledge of the city, whoever the perb was. The criminal had apparently fled to Central Park at night. There were countless areas where the park was dark. Anyone could blend in with their environment if they were smart enough. Peter made a mental note of that as he made his way to the familiar park. The trees occupied his vision, even as he landed inside and scoured the land for any signs of criminal activity. The description was a tall white male with a checkered shirt, combat boots, white shorts, and a snake tattoo on his left thigh. Peter grimaced at the thought of the man. Peter thought the man deserved to be in jail for his clothes alone. Peter swung through the park, using the trees. Although it was harder than it was when there were giant buildings around him, he kept going and hoping he could find the man. He saw police searching, but no signs of the criminal, even as they went by the second half of the park. Peter had searched every nook and cranny he could think of. He wondered if the man was insane enough to hide in the upper corner of the park. Figuring he had no other options, Peter swung there. The gates surrounded the park weren't far from him now. He could see them and a couple civilians on the other side of them. Inside the park, there weren't many around. A few of them glanced at Spider-Man as he crawled through the vicinity and searched for a possible man with a checkered shirt. He got out of the public eye and went into the particularly shady corner where there was a patch of trees. The grass tickled his calves as he passed by, pressing one hand on the bark and peeking his head out through the thickness to see if he could spot anyone hidden away. Much to his amazement, he did. A man shot out and punched Peter. His spider senses hissed and told him there was more danger on the way. Peter dodged the kick and punch. The man attempted to throw his way. Instead, he returned the favor. 
It was the suspect. He had the checkered shirt and the ugly shorts. It was the strangest combination of clothes Peter had ever seen. The combat boots struck out because of the choice to have shorts instead of pants, and the tattoo was clearly visible on his left thigh. Peter fought back and knocked the man over, getting on top of him and punching the man over and over again. His rage built up inside of himself as he punched. Peter slowed his motions, hoping the man was down and not going to try anything again. However, when he pulled his fist back, he saw the face of Harry Osborne staring back at him. Gwen's face flashed in his mind, and Peter lashed out. He yelled and punched the man over and over and over again until blood soaked his fists and his eyes were clogged with tears. His nose left snot fall out of it until Peter could taste the bitterness of his own body. The rage built up inside of him until he prepared to land the killing blow. That was when he stared at the criminal. It wasn't Harry. Peter's mind had played a trick on him because the two men shared the same eye color and facial structure. Still, it wasn't Harry. It was an illusion, a fake. Peter slumped to the ground and placed his hands on the side of his head. He had almost killed a man for the sake of anger. The black suit covering him made him tremble. It tried to fill his thoughts with positive words and phrases. It whispered to him that he did the right thing, that he should finish the man for daring to hurt Spider-Man. Peter refused. He got up and ran to the police, directing them to the man. He didn't stick around to see how the medical treatment went. He swung away, went home, threw clothes to cover the suit, and sat on his bed. He didn't know what to think. He didn't know what to feel. There was only one person who could help him comprehend his thoughts and feelings. One person who could understand what he was going through, Aunt May. Peter sat at the table and folded his hands together. He was visiting Aunt May. He hadn't done it often since Gwen passed away, and he decided to start his adult life, like he did not too long ago. He only visited when he needed to get something from his room. More often than not, he visited to stare at the pictures of Gwen he had in his room. It made him feel weaker than he was. Now, sitting at the kitchen table and sipping on a cold coffee, Parker realized the suit made him weaker, not stronger. You're not in your room, May said, as she came over with a laundry bin in her hands. She sat down on the kitchen counter and threw dirty clothes in the washer. She didn't speak again. Her silence was an invitation for Peter to speak, but he didn't know what to say to fill the void. Coffee was all Peter could say as he took another sip. The silence continued as May loaded the laundry. By the time she was done, two minutes later, Peter had finished his coffee. He prepared to leave and go upstairs, but he stayed put. He couldn't run away from his problems. Not this time. I hurt someone, Peter admitted, and May turned back at that. I didn't mean to, but... I got so angry that I hurt someone. Lots of people. Actually, I hurt an innocent co-worker who was just trying to do his job. A man who did nothing to me. And you. Most importantly, May said. Pulling out a chair and sitting across from him, you hurt yourself. What? But I- Peter, May interrupted. Her tone was soft like a lullaby. I know you. You don't hurt people unless you hurt yourself. The person you've hurt the most is you. I don't know about that, Peter said with a chuckle, drained of any humor. The guy I hurt didn't look so good, and neither do you. Peter felt quiet at that. May noticed his reluctance to speak and signed. She leaned forward and placed her hand on the top of his. That had Peter snapping his head up, so he could meet her caring gaze. You've been through so much at such a young age. I don't think you give yourself enough credit for that. May said quietly, but Peter trailed off and hung his head. You deserve better than what the world gave you. I'm sorry, Peter, but I hope you know I'm proud of you. You're trying your best to move on. It doesn't feel like I am, Peter replied in a tight voice. It feels like I'm doing the opposite. Everyone has a reason to hope. You have so much power inside of you. You preserve it through every curve of life throws at you. And that's what makes you so strong. That's what gives you your power. Now, I have to use it responsibly, Peter whispered, and May nodded, 
her head to agree. Peter got up and wiped one of his tears. May mimicked his position, rounding the table to embrace him. He trembled as he returned to the hug, rubbing his lips together and staring at the humming of the washing machine. The machine was the only noise other than Peter's soft sniffles. Every few seconds, they held each other for another minute before Peter parted from her and managed to smile. I think I need to see my room, he said. Yes, you do she replied, squeezing his shoulders before moving out of his way. Peter sat and loaded it up, staring at his Gwen lock screen and, and sucking in a breath. He had already had the familiar flash drive plugged in. He opened it and clicked on the single file inside. Gwen's graduation speech. The video loaded. The black screen stared at him. Until he hovered his finger over it, he pressed play and faced her, and her face took over the blackness. It's easy to feel hopeful on a beautiful day like today, but there will be dark days ahead of us too. There will be days where you feel alone, and that's when all hope is needed most. No matter how buried it gets, or how lost you feel, you must promise me that you will hold on to hope. Peter paused the video. He could look at her. He wanted to see her again, but he knew he didn't have that privilege. As much as it hurt, the longer he stared at the screen meant the longer he would take to become the true Spider-Man, the Spider-Man the city needed. Peter's phone buzzed. He took it out of his pocket to check it. He had a text from Jameson asking for him to send more shots soon. Peter unlocked his phone to answer, but his phone brought him to the dating app instead. The eyes of Mary Jane Watson stared back at him. He hesitated before changing to his messenger app. After answering Jameson, he slid his phone back inside of his pocket and gazed at the screen. Gwen smiled as she performed her speech and Peter found himself softly smiling with her. He rubbed his thumb across the corner of the laptop. Then, he shut it and walked away. Peter couldn't take it anymore. He had enough. He tried one more time to put the suit, but he knew there was no reasoning with the symbiote. He had no idea how to get it off. He had tried everything in the past, but nothing worked. Get off of me, Peter shouted. As he swung through the city, he was rejecting the symbiote now that caused a clash between them as he tried to get away from the public eye. The last thing he needed was more attention to the dark spider suit that he had already got. Peter went between the buildings and fought to get to the outskirts, away from the crowds that could record him or get caught in the crossfire of Peter's turmoil. He was slower than usual. Peter ended up stopping by clinging to the sides of buildings, and trying to rip the suit off. It didn't work. The symbiote stayed attached to him. It hissed at him every time he attempted to take it away. Peter grunted and continued his search of a safe spot to go. He found an old church that had its doors closed, but an opening where the bell was. His anger turned to desperation as he saw the safe haven. With all of his might, Peter increased his speed and went crashing into the bell tower. He went flying so fast that he rammed into the bell and caused it to chime. He yelped from the sudden volume, but he wasn't the only one who made a noise. Peter paused and got up, noticing how the suit seemed to be reacting negatively to the sounds of ringing. Peter waited until the bell went silent. As soon as it did, the suit did too. Peter banged himself again against the bell, over and over again, until more screeching occurred. The symbiote cried out and tried to free itself from Peter. He managed to grasp onto a hole, a weakness in the suit. He tore it, managed to get the mask off. He yelled as he pulled with all of his strength. The symbiote resisted and screamed, but Peter ignored it. He ripped through the shreds of the symbiote and he could smell the bitterness radiating from it. Sweat dripped down his skin as he fought harder, pulling at every last string until his torso was exposed. He threw it off. Now, he had little left. Using the last of his strength, he removed the rest of the symbiote from him. His web shooters were all that remained. Peter panted and kneeled over. The symbiote was gone. It already slithered away and went down the hole that sat below the bell. 
Peter coughed and caught his breath. He glanced around the small room he was in, noting how empty and dark it was, yet it felt bright. Peter grinned. For the first time since Gwen died, he didn't feel bad for smiling. Peter got to his feet, pranced to the side of the church and swung away. He took the back roads and alleys as to not be seen exposed. He had backpacks all over the city so he could get changed. After two minutes, he made it to one and got changed into a casual attire, shoving his web shooters inside and deciding to take the subway like every other citizen. Peter kept his grin the entire time. From now on, Peter would be strong. From now on, Peter would be a better role model for both himself and the people around him. From now on, he would never let himself slip into that darkness again. Eddie didn't know what to do. He had been watching Peter for several days now, trying to uncover the secrets that the man had. However, he got sidetracked when he saw Spider-Man swinging toward the church. That led him to dropping the case against Peter and going after the vigilante instead. Eddie didn't have his professional camera with him, but he had his phone, and that was enough. With his phone armed with the camera app, Eddie had followed Spider-Man to the church. Eddie couldn't climb, so he opted to enter through the front doors and search for the culprit. Eddie could finally one-up Peter. He could level the playing field and gain some respect around the workplace. He had been terrorized by co-workers because of how he let Peter Parker all those people boss him around. It made him look pathetic. In a way, Eddie felt it too. The inside of the church was made of stone. The wooden pews were lined up and down the main hall. Eddie heard the distant yelling that sounded like it was coming from where the bell was. Seeing as the bell rang several times as he approached, he wasn't alone. Spider-Man was there. Eddie watched from the bottom. He couldn't see the full body of Spider-Man, but what he saw when the man slammed his body against the bell, he took as many pictures as he could, but none of them gave him a clear view of who or what Spider-Man was doing. Eddie considered going up to help the man, but a loud screech sound and reverberated around the walls of the church. It didn't sound human. If anything, it sounded the farthest from human it could get. The screeches increased in volume until Eddie spotted droplets of black goo oozing off the side of the stone. The circular hole around below the bell showed Eddie Spider-Man as he banged himself against the bell over and over again until it rang loudly enough for the strange screeching to reach its peak volume. More blackness came. It formed a string-like substance as it came closer to Eddie Brock. It was like a hand reaching out to him, a guiding hand. It was his bright star in a dark night sky. He backed up out of fear, but the goo called to him. Eddie stood underneath it, but before he could touch it, he glanced up and saw Spider-Man slumped over. The man kneeled over, coughed, and fought to catch his breath. That was when Eddie saw the identity of Spider-Man, Peter Parker. Hate boiled throughout his body when he saw the man there. However, before he could yell or fight back, Peter got up, glanced around the small room, and left the area. Based on the swinging Eddie heard outside, he could tell Peter had left the church behind. As soon as the swinging faded away, a touch hit Eddie's shoulders. It was the black goo. Eddie welcomed it despite the terror spilling on his tongue. His veins skyrocketed with adrenaline. His vision turned red as he thought of Peter Parker and all he had done to Eddie Brock. Eddie's life had become pathetic and weak. His co-workers embarrassed him. His boss hated him. His pay got reduced so Jameson could give it to Peter instead. It didn't help that he had nothing waiting for him at home other than his thoughts. As the goose surrounded him, Eddie embraced it. It morphed with his body and clung to every inch of his flesh. Eddie laughed as it stuck to him, formed a monster he thought didn't look so different from him. He became taller, stronger, faster, and as soon as the suit finished its formation, he broke free from his cage. His mind 
cried from the relief as he bursted through the church's walls. He broke outside and let the night sky engulf him. He was a monster, the size of two Spider-Mans combined. The power surged through him and made him feel larger than life. For once, he wasn't pathetic. For once, he felt free. He stepped forward and ended up prancing around the empty sidewalks. The church was near the outskirts of the city, which meant there were no people around to witness the new creature roaming the streets. He went to go inside an alleyway when he stepped on something. It crunched under his feet. He picked up his foot and saw the words Daily Bugle written on the top of the wrinkled newspaper article. An entire box of newspapers was next to him. A bright blue mailbox contracted the darkness of his body. He hissed at the object before he tore it to shreds. He destroyed the box and ripped every last paper to shreds. From now on, he wouldn't be weak. From now on, he wouldn't be seen as a pathetic worker who folded to Peter Parker, of all people. From now on, Venom would be the one people listened to. Peter flipped the note over and over again in his hand. It was the note that had Octavius 96, the note in his father's handwriting. He had scoured through what seemed like thousands of notes left by his father, all describing the symbiote and making it seem as though it had a larger purpose. Peter didn't believe that. He believed it didn't need to be in New York City, and it definitely didn't need to be on Earth. Peter set the note on top of the other folded up notes. He shoved it in the metal tin can he once used to hold the symbiote in. It was almost overflowing with notes, all of which about the symbiote and the research conducted on it. Peter was about to close the lid when he paused and waited. It wasn't a spider sense. This time, it was him. His eyes darted to his phone, which laid on the desk beside him. It begged him to unlock it. Peter couldn't bring himself to. It felt as though there was something else he had to do first. His fingers traced across the picture of Gwen. He had hung up. It was a small one, almost like a Polaroid. The smile he had fallen in love with was present. It stared back at him as he brushed his hand alongside it. Although his heart ached, as he did. He peeled the picture off his desk. He, he brought it to his eyes and observed the way her eyes crinkled and her nose scrunched up. There was no beauty that shined brighter than her. He hoped she knew that. Wherever she was, she deserved to know. Peter placed the picture on top of all the notes. It would be the first thing he saw if he ever decided to open the metal tin up again. He hesitated. Then, he closed the lid and put it on the top shelf of the closet. He made sure to close the closet door after he was done. He wasn't throwing it away or getting rid of it. That little tin made up a part of Peter that he couldn't really make disappear. Instead, he put it in a better place, a place where it belonged. Peter plopped back in front of his desk and picked up his phone, opening it like it begged him to do earlier. What awaited him was the dating app and the woman he hadn't made a decision on yet. He had swiped left on every single person thus far. However, Mary Jane Watson had a different feel to her. Her mind, her pictures drew him in and kept him there. He couldn't get her out of his mind. His fingers pressed itself against the screen. The app registered his movement and lit up. The screen almost blinded him. His mind jumped between dozens of thoughts as his sweat formed on his hands. His teeth shot out and nibbled on his lower lip until he broke little chuckles of dead skin off and swallowed them. The redhead stared at him on the other side of the phone. He hesitated no longer. He moved his finger and swiped right. The dating app made a loading motion before the action went through. The screen adjusted to the new information. Her profile popped up again, but this time in a different way. The colors were vibrant, as if in celebration. They danced across his display, showing off three words above Mary Jane Watson's profile. Three words that had his eyes widening and his body going still. It's a match. And that is going to be... If I had written The Amazing Spider-Man 3, oh my god, you can tell how happy I am to finally have this one out. This was incredible. I didn't want this to end. You know, as I'm finishing the storyline, my fellow watchers, 
wow. I was very, very happy to, to do this story. This was a great story to have on the channel. A lot of people really wanted this story to be a If I Had Written, and I was like, it's coming soon. A lot of people really wanted it, but I didn't want to rush the storyline, and I think it proves to be one of the best stories out there. I really had such a fun time doing this one. This was great. There were so many ideas and doing MJ, I didn't feel like a lot of people are going to ask me why I didn't have Venom in the storyline. And so the reason was, is I was like, okay, what hasn't really been done with the symbiote? Like, it feels like it gets harder and harder to do a symbiote storyline. I mean, look at Marvel Spider-Man 2. They're doing they're doing a storyline, I believe, Harry Osborn's Venom now, so they got that going. But going back to that, it's like, how do you reinvent the wheel so many times before? And I thought it would be great to see if Peter was his own villain. Instead of having, you know, a different villain and Spider-Man fights him and he has the symbiote and then he got to, you know, he's got to rip it off. I thought it would have been interesting if he was his own villain. And I think that really showcased because, you know, he started to bully um, Eddie Brock and that was something that you know he started to realize near the end was that okay like Aunt May is starting to worry about me like I'm I'm bullying an innocent co-worker and the symbiote is really you know trying to you know manipulate things and show me different ways uh, of living my life and I think that was a great um, you know, plot point with the storyline and really doing that. I've seen a lot of people do uh, pre-writes or rewrites, uh, you know, doing stories with, uh, you know, writing The Amazing Spider-Man 3, but I really wanted mine to stand out from everything else. I really was like studying the comics and studying what hasn't been done yet and what has been done. And it really did take me some time to realize what I wanted within the storyline is I was like, okay, I want The Amazing Spider-Man 3 not to have MJ, not to have Gwen, just to be about, you know, Peter himself and really struggling with the fact that had killed somebody. And that was his, you know, Gwen Stacy. And so, I think it was interesting having Mary Jane uh, through the dating app at the very beginning because, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen, right? And so at the very end when, you know, he gets a match, this is like a new beginning for Spider-Man, a new beginning for Peter Parker, and he's finally, he's finally let go of Gwen Stacy, so that part of him is finally, you know, done, it's gone, he's moving on, he's moving forward. So it was a very different uh, storyline, and again, I cannot thank everybody so much for supporting uh, If I Had Written episodes because I really try my best to provide the best content for you. And so, that being said, if you guys do enjoy these videos and would like to see more, do make sure to subscribe, like, share, and turn those notifications on so you and your friends are all up to date with the latest content. I do want to say that after The Amazing Spider-Man 3, we have the Sinister Six spinoff film, and then we have The Amazing Spider-Man 4, and then we have Maximum Carnage, and then we have Spider-Man 5 all the way through 10, so that will be very interesting. Um, but that being said, if you guys want to support the channel, make sure to check out the Patreon as it's starting at just $1 a month, and it really, really helps a lot. It really goes a long way. Even if it's just one singular dollar, it really goes forward to helping me create a lot of these videos. But thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll see you in the next video. Again, thank you so much for 200,000 subscribers. Thank you so much. I cannot believe it. I still am shocked. I do want to say we're going to get this channel to a million one day. One day we're going to get to a million subscribers. And I cannot thank you so much, everybody who's been watching for years. It's been an outstanding experience, and I cannot wait to continue. That being said, peace out.